Thirty-four men, women and children lost their lives here and the question that now haunts those left behind is whether something could have been done to lessen the loss of life. I was on the phone to her at five o'clock and uh, I asked her, I said, what are you going to do? And she said, we're in the house, we've got the cat in the house, we're weighing up our options. And that was the last we heard of her. We've lost a lot of lives and... Uh, uh, if things had gone better, those lives wouldn't have been lost. So I'm open to any suggestions in the future. The now scattered community has come back to Marysville to farewell Lizzie Fisk and her son Dalton, 15 years old. The wife and youngest child of the captain of the Marysville Fire Brigade perished in their home as Glenn Fisk and his oldest son, Kellen, did their best to defend the town. For no one is the burden harder to bear of what might have been different on the day. I would have dearly loved to have got a lot more people out of the place. But I did. I had no idea of the size of, of what it was we were facing. Marysville was well known as one of the prettiest townships in the Yarra Valley region, northeast of Melbourne. It was near enough for day trippers and a popular spot for tourists to spend a few days at one of its many guest houses and walk the local bush trails. This slideshow was put together by one of the residents for her grandmother's 85th birthday. And then the fires came. As the Royal Commission into Victoria's bushfires seeks to uncover what went wrong, Four Corners seeks the answers from the stories of those who were in the eye of the storm at Marysville that day. Glenn Fisk now lives just outside of Marysville. He's been loaned this house for as long as he needs it for himself, his daughter Bronte and his son Kellen. Glenn Fisk has gone back to work at a local sawmill and his children are back at work and school. Their father is determined to do his best to help them all press on with life from the day their lives were changed forever, Saturday, February the 7th. On that morning, Glenn Fisk prepared to go down to the fire station with his oldest son, Kellen. They were joining around a dozen other volunteers of the Country Fire Authority's Marysville Brigade. Well, we had a lot of apprehension because it was um, touted as being such a bad day and, and the weather conditions um, had dictated that. We had high temperature. And when you had a forecast of, of high winds, um, we had a good, a strong northerly running most of the morning, most of the day. And that was what the forecast was. So, so weather-wise, we were concerned. In the mid-afternoon, that concern was realised. A new fire started near the Murrindindi Mill, about 25 kilometres from the townships of Marysville and Narbathong, on the far side of the Black Range. The police have evidence that it was deliberately lit. The captain of the Murrindindi Fire Brigade, Ron Philpot, was the first to radio in the fire shortly before 3pm. 
Within 15 minutes, CFA firefighter David McKenzie had got to the scene. This is the spot he reckons the fire was started. And this is, this is your best guess spot. is, yeah, yeah, after the spot? Yep, yep. And just headed over that way towards the mill and straight over there heading towards Marysville. Yeah. When you got here, what did it look like? Well, it only just took off, so it was gathering momentum as it went and um, just fanning out slowly that way. But basically the front of the fry was flying over as it would be with that wind. Around about, uh, three the Department of Sustainability and Environment, point, uh, the DSE, the had overall control of the response uh, the to the Murrindindi fire the from the incident uh, control room uh, in nearby Alexandra. Seven, Peter seven, Rice was the deputy time incident time. controller, and, uh, a volunteer with a country fire authority. His job was right to allocate the their strike teams. His problem was that, that, that just before he heard of the new fire, he'd sent a strike team off to a separate fire in the Wangdong area. Area. Now he urgently needed them back. Uh, unfortunately, due to the telephone line congestion, I had did have some trouble getting through to uh, to the region, and also the uh, two-way radio system was heavily overloaded too. So it took uh, something like 10, 12 minutes for me to actually uh, get permission to divert the strike team. What difference can 10, 12 minutes make? Who knows? Um, it, on a day like that, you've obviously got to uh, hit any fire quickly while it's still small. And I'm talking about you know, probably a quarter of a hectare, half a hectare. If you could get enough tankers onto a fire whilst it's still that small, you may be able to contain it. About 45 minutes after it started, at around 3.30, the fire could be seen as a plume of smoke from the Marysville side of the Black Range. At 20 to 4, Glenn Fisk got a request to send one of Marysville's two tankers off to Murrindindi. It may well have made no difference, but he was reluctant. I questioned whether our tanker should go. And I sort of, I hinted that I didn't actually stand up and say, no, it's not going. Um, but I, I sort of questioned, in my mind, I, I seriously questioned, but because you thought it might be needed here. Yeah, but there's a, a CFA policy, and I'm happy for it, that you fight the fire you got, not the one you might have. Otherwise, you wouldn't have any resources go anywhere, would you? Um, and, and, and I had no idea of the size and the, and the speed the thing was travelling at Murrindindi. That's what I can't understand, because people who were there at Murrindindi within 15 minutes, at Murrindindi Mill within 15 minutes of that fire starting, said it just raced up the mountain. And, and why can't that information get to you? <clears throat> I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't know where, where that gap in the information is. Um, yeah, no, I don't, really don't know the answer to that one. About half an hour later, the winds that raced ahead of the Murrindindi fire had reached the town of Narbathong, just eight kilometres from Marysville. By 4.30, there were burning embers. Chris Gleeson, a Marysville firefighter, had driven here to Narbathong to what was then his workplace to get a closer look. That's when I noticed that there was gum nuts falling everywhere in the mill, tiny gum nuts and sheets of bark and all that. And I thought, oh, this does not bode well, you know. And um, I jumped in my car again and headed back to Marysville to tell them what was coming at them. And uh, when I, I got to Marysville and, um, you know, I said to the boys at the station, I said, we're going to come under severe ember attack here at any moment and um, we better start, you know, planning what we're going to do. It was worrying news for Glenn Fisk. There was different bits of chatter on the CFA radio um, that, that we were listening to, but not intently because we are doing other things. Um, and to find out there was actually spotting in Narbathong, I think um, one of our firemen had been down there and, and saw it and came back and told us. So that was the first real real idea we had that there was 
spotting into Narbathon. Up in the tower on Mount Gordon, looking down on Narbathon and Marysville, the DSE's fire spotter had watched the Murrindindi fire race up towards him and was frantically making calls. The DSC will not confirm the timing or the content of these calls, so accounts are second-hand. He supposedly stayed up in that tower, ringing people in little pockets, little settlements, little dead-end roads and that around Narbathong here, warning them that there was a fire coming at him and the speed that it was coming and just telling them to get out. And uh, he was probably responsible for saving a lot of people's lives that day just by staying up there and, and ringing around and uh, getting the word out that, uh, you know, what was coming. And the word was, get out. Mm, absolutely. The spotter phoned Marysville, reportedly, at about 4.30. I understood that you got a call from the Mount Gordon spotter. Tell, tell me about what you know about that call. No, I got information relayed to me. Someone else took the call. Um, as as you could quite imagine, there's a lot of people around, um, and I've got questions and, and information being fired at me all the time. So I don't I don't have a clear recollection. Do you know of any discussion that there was within DSE at the Incident Control Centre or anywhere in which there was a contemplation of evacuating Marysville? No. No. The only one small part of that was that one of the guys from the SES said to me, um, and I don't know when, I don't know what part of it, is that we've got a list of elderly and, in, and infirm people that that we'd like to get out. Do you think we should activate that now? And I think I said to them, it'd be a very good idea. Yeah. There's a couple of trees I've, I've cut down because... The retirement were, village um, was evacuated early, so but State Emergency Services before. volunteer Ian Walters um, says their was, list of other um, residents who needed help was short. People who had uh, no vehicles or disabilities or uh, we had a, a list of a few people that we had to evacuate the town, um, but there was obviously a lot more people that should have been on that list than what we had. How many were on that list? Uh, I think there was only half a dozen. Do you think more lives might have been saved if the list had been longer? I think so, yes. By around five o'clock, the smoke from the Murrindindi fire was clearly visible to the residents of Marysville. Some mistakenly got the idea it was smoke from the separate Kilmore fire. The DSE's first warning on ABC Radio that Marysville was under threat from the Murrindindi fire was not till 25 to 6. We're now extending that threat message to include the communities of Marysville and Buxton, which we also expect to come under uh, direct attack from this fire. A local photographer, Daryl Hull, took these pictures. Were you alarmed when you were filming? Yes, very. Yes, extremely. Because you didn't know where this, what it was, which direction it was coming from. It was mounting even as you looked at it. The, the plume of smoke uh, just seemed to get bigger and bigger. So then I got on the phone to the Victorian bushfire info line, on hold there for about 20 minutes. And when the operator answered, um, he had to to look, I think he had to look up and see where, where Marysville was. I rang my daughter Kay and I said, what's happening? She said, we'd spoken to the policeman and it's just smoke from Kilmore or somewhere else. And I said to Len, what about those red spots I can see in the smoke? And he said, that's because the sun is high in the sky. I accepted that. The cloud <clears throat> was was like a huge mushroom with an absolutely the brightest, or a plate with the brightest gilt edge you could ever imagine. We just watched it from there and people were still thinking it was Kilmore, Kilmore smoke. Kilmore smoke, yeah, that's right, yep. Mm. So you weren't worried? 
Not at that stage. Alarmed. No. I was alarmed. Well, I wasn't. I was inside working. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, we were ready to open the restaurant um, to serve meals and that. Uh, everything was like a normal day, except for the heat, extreme heat, um, and this mushroom cloud of smoke. This is on the road into Marysville at 5.33. The fire is now just three or four kilometres away, extending behind Mount Gordon. On ABC, it was 25 to 6 when Marysville was first mentioned as being under threat. Do you think that was a bit late? In retrospect, yes. Um, um, I believe that uh, it would have been far better to have warnings out earlier. I don't know why that warning wasn't issued uh, earlier. I know that the incident control centre here in Alexandra is extremely busy. The local community radio station, UGFM, got warnings out for Marysville half an hour earlier than the ABC, just after five. This is a UGFM urgent bushfire information alert. Yes. Manager Peter Weeks used unofficial contacts from within the DSC as he knew the official warnings we're running behind the fire. There is uh, spotting occurring uh, in quite a lot of places to the west of the Mount Gordon Tower. Now that uh, means that uh, it's getting very close to the Marysville area, so uh, this is unofficial, I must uh, say to you, but uh, residents in the Marysville area should uh, uh, enact a bushfire plan, I would think, uh, at this point in time. The fire was moving so fast, uh, one of the reports we had with, was that uh, houses were not currently under threat. Uh, now, we knew that wasn't the case, and we had to state, well, this is what the official line is, but we do not believe this is correct. We believe that, that you are under threat and that there are embers uh, falling in, your, in that area at the particular time, and that's what we did. Um, and that was against what the CFA were officially saying? Yes. Glenn Cherry and Pam Phillips had the community radio station on in the background while they were working, but still did not pick up on the warnings. So what would have helped you? No. With well, more... perhaps um, on the radio, if they have some sort of screeching siren, say, emergency, emergency, I thought that's what they actually had at one stage, some sort of signal um, which would draw attention to it. And then uh, possibly whatever you're doing, you'd think, well, that's strange. And listen, have a, you'd actually listen to a Pay message. Attention, mm. yeah. yeah, on the radio. The CFA's Peter Rice had in fact tried to get the emergency siren broadcast on the radio, but couldn't get through the official ropes. I've got to uh, contact the uh, operations manager for this region who then asked the police inspector to activate it and I couldn't get through to, uh, to the regional headquarters by, as I said before, telephone or by radio. So uh, that was something that I was frustrated about that afternoon. Well, we won't argue over the tree again, will we? No, so. it is a lovely tree, tree, but it will be good because it will go. Ken and Christine Adams owned the scenic bed and breakfast motel. It used to look like this. This is what's left. When they saw the smoke, they tried to get information from official websites and the ABC with no luck, but not local radio. I had really been focusing more on trying to get the DSE site up. That was jammed, couldn't get, up, get it up. And set um, the CFA site and 774. That's, for some reason, I really wasn't focusing on the local radio station. But you couldn't get any information off the no. bushfire no. information no. line or the CFA no. website? It's getting to late afternoon. The power went out. Um, obviously, that's when we lost computer. And, um, I, I then drove down to the uh, main street to see what was going on down there, if I could find out any information. I then went up to the CFA office um, and spoke to uh, Glenn Fisk, the um, Marysville fire, fire Chief, and asked him that we had some guests in and what I should do. 
and he, with sharpness and authority, said, get your guests out, get them out via Alexander. There is no uh, other way out uh, and do it now. This was the road into Marysville at 5.45. You told Ken Adams, I believe, it was, to get out. Yeah. Do you wish that or think about whether or not it would have been a good thing if more people had been able to get that message? Obviously. There's two people I would dearly love to have got that message. So what are you asking me, Liz? <laughs> I didn't no, mean to put I, it in that personal way. But. I know, but, but it is. That's where it is and that's where I am. That's, that's probably why I've got such big holes in, in what I recall. Because, yeah, I would have... Um, I would, would have dearly loved to have got a lot more people out of the place. But I did. I had no idea of the size of, of what it was we were facing. And I don't think anybody else did. Marysville at 5.51. Many homes had by now lost their power and their phones were down. The Marysville CFA fire siren had gone off earlier in the day, twice and only briefly. Then they turned it off. The CFA emphasises it's there to call the volunteers to the emergency centre, not as a warning system. But did people understand that? What do they think the siren's for? The siren's there to, to, to call firefighters to go to the station to, to go and address a fire. That's, that's what it's there for. Elaine Postlethwaite was a long-term Marysville resident. Her husband, Len, at 82, was Marysville's oldest man. He spent his working life as a timber merchant. Elaine had become increasingly anxious to leave Marysville as the smoke got darker, but she couldn't drive. Len Postlethwaite refused to move from his chair on the veranda. She ended up walking out onto the road alone and was picked up by a passing emergency vehicle. Her husband perished in the fire. He was found at the car, so he must have eventually decided it was time to go, but he obviously left it too late. Because a lot of people would have done the same. They remained in their houses because there was no siren. It should have gone loud and continuously in a, that emergency, and it was a big emergency. People would have said, what's on? What's happening? What's happening? What's happening? And they would have moved, I'm sure. Even Len. Because I kept saying to people, I haven't heard the siren. Because apparently, Nowadays, they don't do the siren because the CFA had pages. But what about the rest of us? We needed a warning, surely. I think if, if people heard a siren and they could see the smoke and um, everything happening on the day, I'm sure that they would have seen that as a, as a warning to, that things weren't good. As communication systems collapsed, Warnings were largely by word of mouth. People risked their lives driving around, warning friends and neighbours. People such as Jeff Grady, who then himself did not make it out in time. Jeff from the fruit salad farm pulled up out the front and uh, had a conversation with Pam. He said uh, that they were already in trouble at the fruit salad farm, which is a restaurant to the southeast. Yeah. And. Um, he said, you've, you've got about 10 minutes to get out, yeah. 15 minutes to get out. So that was when we first realised that there was uh, trouble heading our way. He did a wonderful run trying to warn people. Very brave person. Yeah, it was. Of course, we also had people that wanted to stay and fight, and they just weren't aware of the ferocity of this fire either. Do you know people who made that decision and didn't get out? A couple, mm. The 
from around 6 p.m., people started gathering at the Marysville oh, Oval. Unclear and uncertain whether to stay or go, the time for choosing to leave early had well and truly passed. There was making a run for it in a car down on certain roads, or sitting it out here, hoping it was safe. My boss was in her car and she was saying, come on, Daryl, get in the car with me. And I had that dreadful moment of having to not do the chivalrous thing. I thought uh, I want to be with her and help her, but really the thought of dying in a car on a roadside with flame was too horrific. It was difficult driving away, but um, I just went and it was like flight. It was flight. Mm survival of oneself and anyone who's with you who, who chooses to make the decision to come. At 27, Glenn Fisk got an official CFA red flag alert. The wind change was imminent. He says it was the only official warning he had received that day that spelt big trouble. When you say you didn't get any warnings, what do you mean by that? Personally, I didn't. I didn't. I, I got a red flag warning on the weather, which came on on a pager, um, which told me that the wind change was imminent, and I knew that I knew with that information that we had big trouble. Yeah. The timing of the wind change meant the fire would blow right across the town and fast. Glenn Fisk passed this on to the SES volunteers. They knew suddenly at quarter to seven that time was really short. Three of them jumped into a couple of cars. It was just a matter of, OK, let's alert as many people as possible. If the, um, if you want to believe, the CFA were up around the back of the town um, and we just drove up and down a few roads with the sirens going and the other vehicle was doing the same, just to let it alert as many people and was within probably... 15, 20 minutes, it was in darkness and embers in town. This is the only vision of the oval, as two police cars organise over 50 vehicles into a safe convoy out. The police and the UCS volunteers were in the last cars to leave. That was shortly before 7pm. This footage was taken from the oval at 7.15. When the convoy of 50 or so cars is down by the Oval? I, have, I wasn't aware of any of that. And the police escorted them I out? I saw something in the, in the news about it later, later on, but I didn't... I, I wasn't aware of any of that F from where I was. Because you were... I was, I was busy looking out for what I was doing, yes, yeah. Yes, we were we were trying to get our the strike team set up up on Kings Road we <clears throat> during those to that time. And what was the hope for the strike team? What were you? What... <laughs> uh, the hope, the little hope, <laughs> um, to take the sting out of that. Um, spot fire that had started on that southern edge of the town. The DSE's Incident Control Centre had sent two strike teams to Marysville to help fight off the fire. They didn't arrive till 6.15. They were sent straight up here to the King's Road at 6.24, where the spot fire had been seen. There were 12 fire trucks and tankers manned by over 50 CFA volunteers, with an extra eight or nine firefighters from the DSE. The DSE guys lit a controlled burn to create a fire break. Within 15 minutes, they were all engulfed in burning embers and just escaped with their lives. CFA volunteer Dick Sinclair was there. The control burn was underway and going, going really well. Um, you know, what got us into strife was the wind change. So the wind swung around more northwesterly and then just brought everything across the top of us. So when, when we retreated from one truck to the, to the next to go under 
uh, under a fog nozzle, which is sort of you're looking after yourself at that stage and your crew, um, you know, from ground level to the tops of the trees was just embers, was burning embers. It was um, very hot. Glenn Fisk was monitoring their progress on the radio from down in the emergency complex, which was by then engulfed in smoke. It was getting noisy where we were um, and dark, and that's the. And sort you were of, worried about what was going on up there. Oh, definitely, because I felt that we were in trouble. So they were out in the they were out in the open. Um, and they said they were retreating to the to the oval, um, and I monitored fairly closely then to make sure that that all of our guys, all of our crews, got got down from there and got got to the uh, the oval. And um, when I heard that they, them say that they'd accounted for everybody, I was quite uh, quite relieved. Yes. Was your son Kellen one of the? Kellen was yes. Up there in the Kings Road. Yes, he was. So you must have been. Oh yeah, I was a little bit concerned about him, of course. Yeah, yeah. But Glenn Fisk had a further concern as well. His wife Lizzie and his younger son Dalton. While patrolling for spot fires earlier in the day, he'd lost his mobile phone and he couldn't get the gnawing worry out of his mind. Yeah, well, that was my link to, to Liz and Dalton. That was, that was my link to my family. <laughs> I was concerned and I was preoccupied, I know that, um, with with their welfare, but that was all concurrent. It was all sort of um, listening to the guys coming down off, off Kings Road. Was the, well, that was all the same time. Um, so I did actually, I think I did try to ring Liz's phone from the comms room after I knew that everyone was down on the oval. Didn't get an answer, so, yeah. I didn't know, at that stage, I didn't know how they were or what, what would have happened. The strike teams that made it down to the oval found there was nothing they could do. The town was going up and fire around them. where the corner cupboard and the general store were. That was the kindergarten. Oh my God. That's the pasticerie gone. That's where the historical society was. I'd say most of the main street's gone. Where the information centre was. Of the 400 buildings that made up the township of Marysville, only 14 were left standing. And that's all that's left of that beautiful church. This is just unbelievable. Over 30 people died most in or near their homes, some in their cars. Many called Triple O for help. Rather shocking, actually, because uh, there was messages coming through, people trapped in houses, people trapped on roads, um, and for 90% of the calls that came through, there was just nothing that uh, anyone could do about it. Marysville burned, Glenn Fisk was inside the emergency complex, surrounded by fire. It was noisy, it was dark, there was um, embers being blown around the place. Sometimes the blinds would move and you could, you would, I'd see um, flame and, and stuff happening outside. Um, Yeah, and, and so we were there to ride it out. There was, there was nowhere to go. But before the fires died down, Glenn Fisk did leave the complex. He needed to see what had happened to his home. 
We left the um, the complex, um, Tomo and I, the local policeman, and uh, went up to home because I was fairly frantic at that stage. And the house was, at that stage, still burning very, very fiercely. Um, and we knew that I couldn't do anything from there, so I had hoped that perhaps Liz and Dalton had got out and um, made it to the Oval or... Well, I don't know. I just maybe maybe they got out. When the fire died down further, Glen Fisk joined up with the other firefighters down at the Oval. Later, they went back to town to see what they could do, helping out pockets of people who'd stayed and defended their houses and survived. There was a couple of houses that we, we put some work into. But there wasn't a lot for us that we could do but by then. Um, so we kept drifting back to the Oval. That's basically what we did for the night through. Until the morning? Yeah. In the morning, Glenn Fisk's wife and son were found at their house. Remember, this was the cupboard. Yeah, the cupboard was over And all here. the crockery. Yep. 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 And we Bruce and Elaine Jefferson uh, were not formally notified okay, of their daughter's <laughs> death for several weeks. But media reports of an unnamed young pregnant <laughs> woman who perished in the fire confirmed their worst fears. They'd been trying in vain to call Nicole or her fiance Jamie Bowker's phone. Nicole um, was found down in Falls Road, um, which is about 600 metres away. She had obviously made a run for it, and uh, being eight and a half months pregnant, to run about six, seven hundred metres down there, she must have been absolutely exhausted. Um, we understand that Jamie was found here somewhere on around the property. Uh, on the property. But uh, we've, we've had no further information. The Jeffersons don't know whether Nicole and Jamie did decide to stay and defend their home, but they do know they were weighing it up as an option. It's the Jeffersons' view that on such a dangerous day, they should have been ordered to leave. They wouldn't have stood a chance. No. If, if you'd stayed. If they'd got out, they would have been fine. I believe that compulsory evacuation should be mandatory, certainly um, on days of total fire ban. Um, th there's got to be something said in, in the Royal Commission uh, about that. Um, a compulsory evacuation probably would have saved, well, maybe 100 lives. So. You know, why, why are these, uh, these people um, saying, you know, st stay and defend or give them the option? They, they should be given that option. I'd like to see a lot of discussion on this in, uh, in coming months. Because what, it's just too hard to stay and defend if it's essentially a fireball? Well, obviously people stayed in Marysville and Narbathon and other places in Victoria on that night, that fateful night and they died. And uh, when you get uh, such bizarre and extreme and uh, unprecedented fire behaviour as this, uh, there may be a case that people in fire prone areas should have to uh, go to other places. The Bushfire Royal Commissioners came to Marysville three weeks ago to hear informally what this community believes are the lessons to be learned from the tragedy that happened here. What we're trying to do today is to enable the commissioners and the commission staff to listen to you. And so we've structured the mixed. format in order... I don't know, I don't know how I feel about the Royal Commission. Nothing could have stopped it, nothing could have prevented this from happening. Um, and I don't know what a Royal Commission's gonna find. 
Why do you think so many lives were lost? They just didn't know the fire was coming. Oh, I think communications and um, evacuation procedures. Um, I know it's a once-off thing that happened and hopefully it's a once-off thing that's happened and we never see this tragedy again, but uh, I think we need to be more aware of, of evacuation procedures. <laughs> Marysville's fire chief has not yet decided whether he'll make a submission to the Royal Commission. Remaking a life for himself and his children is what's most important now. What he does know is that he believes the township of Marysville can and indeed must revive. It has to. It has to. It's home. The sun's come up over the same bit of hill for most of my life. <laughs> and I've got two huge reasons why we need to um, need to be back there. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> no, because you want the kids to grow. You said yesterday to me, you want Bronte and Kellen to grow up here too and feel the same way about Marysville as you do. I have that sense of belonging, yes. Yep. The community of Marysville returned in their hundreds to show how much Lizzie and Dalton Fisk had been part of their lives, that they had belonged here. The emergency services formed a guard of honour as a tribute to the terrible price one of their number has paid. Most, like Glenn Fisk, are volunteers who give of their time, but nobody should be asked to give this much. The Royal Commission will be asking the question, did those who put them in the front line properly discharge their duty of care, with the systems, the preparation and communications up to the job on the day, a day they knew would be of extreme fire danger. The senior ranks of the Country Fire Authority have declined to speak to Four Corners, as has the head of the Department of Sustainability and Environment. Glenn Fisk has no axe to grind. I would just thank everybody for their support. It's been the whole aftermath of the fires has been the most humbling experience I've had in my life. I've never, never experienced this side of people before. Um, Australia as a whole has, uh, has looked after us. I think it's great. <laughs>